experience. They people think it's uh, you know depression comes on because of an event and it's a disease. You know, diabetes doesn't know when to kick in either. So it happened to be after I lost my job and the, the, the depression was the worst it's ever been. I mean, it was, I call it the tsunami of all depressions. And so I started researching maniacally. Uh, that's the good thing about people that are very ambitious is that we do things maniacally. So that's how I studied mindfulness or found mindfulness. But then it creates great careers, but it also means you crash into a wall and burn pretty quickly. So I, um, I tried every kind of therapy known to man. And I even went to, um, to school to get a degree in psychotherapy because I wanted to see who was ripping me off. So that was extreme. <laughs> and then I tried everything. And uh, finally, I came to mindfulness. And I was in the institution, but my husband took me out to do a course while I was still um, a resident. And, um, and so what happened was... Uh, I knew there was something to it, though, when you have depression, I wouldn't suggest doing mindfulness because you haven't got a mind. But I thought this is really when I get better, I'm going to look into this. And so I um, I, I found Mark Williams. He was at Oxford and I cornered him. <laughs> I still wasn't very well. And I said, tell me what happens in the brain, because I'm not touchy feely at all. You know, dream catchers don't mean a lot to me. And I said, just explain to me what happens in the brain. It was on a street corner. And he said, well, if you want to find out how the brain is affected by mindfulness, you'd have to get into Oxford and get your master's. And so I did. And nobody was as surprised as, <laughs> as that man. So I'm, I love the, what attracted me was the evidence. You know, I always say if Oxford were offering witchcraft, maybe I would have taken it, but they weren't at the time. Uh, so what happened was um, I found it fascinating. I loved seeing the results in an MRI scanner. Some people may say, well, it's just science. Well, there's people who think the earth is flat. It's not my business. But I, um, I do see that it's like a muscle. It's exactly like doing a sit-up. There's nothing spooky about it. But the very action of doing mindfulness, the, the exercise, is buffing up parts of the brain that are in charge of focus of attention, the ability to self-regulate. Um, I don't want to get into the, the world of presence and the world of self-compassion, but that's in the package too. But usually when I do talks, I don't mention that until way later, but it certainly is a, a great, um, what do you call it? A gauge to when, you know, when I'm being bombarded by thoughts of self-loathing and the usual reviews, I'm not good enough. I, I now I'm so excited because I heard other people have those. Um, I, I have, at least I have a technique, not 100%, but <clears throat> I can lower those bad reviews and just feel tension or feel stress rather than feeling stressed about stress. And also it's a good um, barometer to see when a depression is sneak, sneaking up on you and then you can start to make plans. Okay, that, that's, that's lovely, that's uh, 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 Ruby. And you, you've got a great way of getting the explanation of mindfulness over to a, a wide audience. Your books have been bestsellers now for, uh, for, for for many, many years. How do you explain mindfulness in those concise terms to such a wide and varied audience? You, you know, I don't get into the fluffy stuff and I think people appreciate that. So I was teaching refugees or I work in a psych ward. They're really flattered that I do take it from, uh, this is what happens in your brain. Uh, I don't say it's wishful thinking or it's positive psychology. You know, for those of us with depression, there's nothing more insulting than positive psychology because that's the last thing we feel. So you're really ladle ladling it on of how far away we are <laughs> from uh, a healthy brain. But I do talk about, you know, I make it simple. If there's any neuroscientist in the audience, I say, I'm sorry. But I do explain that we live in a culture now where now it's used in every conference, but the amygdala, you know, that alarm bell that says maybe there's danger or there's high emotion, it's on all the time. Whereas it used to just warn us if there was a predator behind us, you know, which is necessary. But now there's always a predator, either through the news, duh. I mean, there is a real predator, COVID, but we live in terror now. And then when COVID's over, it'll be Brexit. And when Brexit's over, they'll be, we get addicted to this bad news. That's just human nature. And I always say, why is it bad news? Why don't we get addicted to kale? 
(laughs) (laughs) The hit of adrenaline when you watch bad news. I mean, let's be honest. It's salacious. You know, people start, there's a reptile in all of us. And uh, maybe not all of us, maybe in Wales, you're, you know, you'll be on that. But uh, I certainly know when I start watching the death counts, I can't get my eyes off it. Now I know I have an allergy to the TV, so I shut it down. But don't think I don't know what the death counts are. Somebody will call me to inform me because it's the greatest gossip on earth. Um, so it's the news that kills us. Then now uh, the, you know, the, the same areas activated in your brain, social pain is exactly in the same terrain as physical pain. So whether you're being stabbed in the leg or not invited to a party still activates that amygdala. I could ladle it on, you know, competition now isn't healthy. It used to be because in the tribe, it made you work harder for the sake of the group. But now you're competing with the rest of the world and you'll never come in even a billionth. So there's a lot of, I'm not good enough, you know, in, in, in the air. So it's always, it's not your condition. It's kind of the human condition now. And that's where forgiveness comes in a little bit too. But, um, and I always, so I sort of explain the amygdala is up. Okay, you want to argue or not? That's where the thoughts, you know, the self-hatred, the I'm not good enough. It means you're pretty, the cortisol is really running wild. But if you take your focus to one of your senses and you know everybody knows what they are, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. When you take your focus there, however briefly you can get it there, immediately the amygdala calms down a little bit and parts of the brain are making it simple like the insula, which is in charge of, uh, uh, what is it? Introspection, you can feel with the amygdala, with the, uh, insula and the anterior cingulate cortex which which is in charge of awareness you know people have to understand there's bits of the brain that are in charge of certain features and and other things like the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex i don't you know which is kind of the ability to pull back that constant rumination those get strengthened just like doing enough enough sit-ups you're going to get a six-pack and if you don't do the sit-ups it's not going to happen it's not wishful thinking so i always picture what's happening in a you know, if I could look in an MRI scanner, and I once had my brain scanned when I was in Wales, in Bangor, before and after a um, silent retreat. And sure enough, I wasn't so, um, of course, you need more than one person, but they were kind enough to scan my brain. And uh, after a silent retreat for seven days, I wasn't so, um, you know, my trigger finger wasn't so heightened. They showed you alarming photographs, but it wasn't the same uh, response. You know, the fight and flight response was lower. That doesn't mean I'm blasé and I'm chilling out, which is an expression I hate, because if somebody mugs you, believe me, the amygdala will kick in. But I I was getting very ill with it on all the time. And I think that's what burns people out is when we're constantly gushing. Cortisol and people also say, oh, well, that's a mind thing. Who cares about that? And I've been trying to tell them, well, the mind and the body are a onesie. So when that amygdala starts gushing, it feeds down like a pinball machine through all of your organs and then that cortisol comes out through your, is expressed through your adrenal glands and that takes out your immune system. And then you're open season to a lot of physical diseases. So don't think it's just a bubble up here that has a few thoughts. That's good. R- Ruby, you've, you established uh, your, your charity, Frazzle Cafe, a number of years ago now. You uh, originally started it in Marks and Spencers, I think, in their cafe at six o'clock at night. When COVID came, it went online. Can you tell us about Frazzle Cafe and its potential for here in Wales, the United Kingdom, and beyond. I know you're very proud of it. Well, <laughs> you happen to be the uh, head, the honcho of it, the head trustee, so yeah. you know what it is, but yeah. we can pretend you don't. So I wanted to have a, you know, community also works like a little like mindfulness, is that when we're together in community and we're speaking from the heart, we calm each other's cortisol down. I mean, that's why hundreds of thousands of years ago after a hard day's hunt, people would have each other's backs and they knew how to pull the brakes. And I think Quakers and when people had, uh, you know, more of a religion or they had big family units or they had town hall meetings, we used to have it. And now we're a little, uh, it's each man for himself. So I I have this feeling always that I want to belong to something bigger than myself. And I tried to get an AA, but um, I didn't pass the audition. I said, I repeat myself a lot when I'm 
when I've had too many drinks and they said, that's not good enough, get out of here. <laughs> they to say things like, I've eaten my pets. But anyway, yeah. I thought, well, what's like, well, I have to create something like AA, but we don't, without the higher power, but where I could meet a group of people. I was called my, my tribe. And the instruction is, this isn't about the news. It's not therapy, but this is where we kind of express the weather conditions going on in our mind. And believe me, a hundred people know exactly what I'm talking about. They don't keep going, you know, they, because they feel heard by everybody else. And this is a platform where you have old and young and every nationality and different time zones. And nobody at one point, you can see them thinking, oh, well, she's a different color. You just see heads nod because people are speaking human to each other. And I always, during COVID, I, I did it every night. Now I just finished a meeting. And every time I might be tired or wired, I think, why am I doing this? And I get what religion used to be. Uh, after that, we're feeding each other. The oxytocin is flowing, you know, that bonding chemical. And that's the greatest antidote to cortisol that there is. And when I'm done, and everybody feels it. It's never been a meeting where somebody went, well, what, this, what is this about? You just see their glowing little faces because they feel they were cared for and heard, even if it was just an hour. So I don't know. I mean, we've been doing this for years. Why the government or somebody imitate it. It's a charity. Just say, okay, we're going to give you, and it could have been in town hall meetings when we were still meeting. Organizing a place where people can just be themselves and unload because that's talking is half the cure. I don't know how you prevent depression. I don't know. But if you stop that cortisol bubbling early enough, you just might prevent a lot of disease. I really believe in this. I don't know why other people don't imitate it. I guess because it takes four years to figure out how to do it, but we're ready to train people. Well, and well, perhaps that's something we can take on mindfulness whales. Uh, well, there you go. Yeah. Well, we're happy to train people to do yeah. the And we have, there are people from uh, from health, from social services, from lo local authorities here tonight, from all around Wales. So perhaps that's something we can take back and look at to see how we can promote Fazl mm -hmm. Cafe here in Wales and uh, and take the lead because Welsh Government are serious about well-being. We have the Future Generations Act. Uh, so that, that's something that, that yeah. I think and, can come from. And I invite people tonight. to come and watch it. I mean, I do a Tuesday night from 5.30 to 6.30. And during the day we have hosts, which is smaller meetings, which is how it used to be in, in Marks and Spencer's. I do bigger meetings, but there's breakout rooms at a certain point and you know, they feel they found their tribe and you just, it's unbelievable. People really, when they hear somebody speaking the truth and not moaning, everybody's low there, you can see them lighten up. That's all we, people don't really care about hitting targets. They just want to be liked. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, so if we can put a, a link to, to Frazzle Cafe uh, after this meeting to the 300 odd people that have, uh, that have signed up, they can uh, they can go in, see what you're doing in Frazzle Cafe and maybe take it back to their health authority, their local authority, their social services. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's, that's great. Lovely. Um, now, the... Um, the United Nations uh, have said that the, the, the COVID will affect people mentally as, as well as physically, and they've warned governments around the world that they need to prepare for this, or, or they're not, not prepare for it, they need to implement uh, um, programs that will help on that mental recovery. What's your take on this? Uh, are politicians around the world taking it seriously enough? Are they in this country? What, what, what can... What could you offer? You, you know that they, uh, um, the word trauma to me is the next pandemic. You know, I, I mean, I'm on frazzled. I can hear, I get, uh, you know, a, a, a litmus paper of the, of the uh, national um, mental state, I think, because I'm on it pretty much every night or I was. And I wrote a book, Mindfulness Guide for Survival, which was my, my result, my, um, the themes that were continuously hitting people in the face, things that we didn't face before, uncertainty, change, loneliness, like I wasn't lonely before, death, difficult emotions. We didn't deal with it. And now with no distraction, it was straight in the face. And a lot of people couldn't handle that. It was right in there. You know, usually we live with distraction. I mean, there's bad news about that because eventually <laughs> you will be hit in the face by reality. and There's no muscle to be able to deal with it. So my book was about, let's get ready, because it's there. 
uh, without fear because that'll kill you. Um, but uh, we knew that trauma was going to be the next fallout. Maybe I'm missing something. Did the government mention it? Have there been more money for mental health resources? I, I don't know. I don't listen anymore. I just, we were discussing it before. I think individuals have to take this into their hands because I don't see top down working. So I think when we see there's a need, then we have to do something about it. And, you know, we have to train the individual to care about other people you know, create your own frazzle, go start a food bank, go work with refugees. I mean, that's, go do something rather than say, oh, I'm waiting for the government to change some policies. Yeah, Ruby, that's, uh, we, uh, Mark Drake, the first minister of the, of, uh, of the, of the Senate in, in Wales, when we met with him privately and publicly uh, two years back, he said he doesn't want a top-down approach. He wants a bottom-up co-production approach. So what you're saying, to us tonight is exactly what is the feeling of, of, of Welsh government. Again, any, any tips on how we can do that? As I say, over 300 people here, many of them- You're from in Wales. the government, why don't you start making it a policy <laughs> that we help people with <laughs> mental health and can and convince people that mental isn't some lightweight, you know, it's like, what do they call when people in medicine train to be psychiatrists, it's called what, the Cinderella? Yeah. Um, Cinderella, what is it? A course or way of doing medicine, which means it's lightweight. Yeah. So, and, um, it, yeah. And also Cinderella funding, we just get the, 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 little, the little bits for mental health and uh, the big bits uh, for, for heart and cancer. Um, but, that's, but that's caused by, yeah. it's, it's the cause of um, certain cancers, diabetes too, heart disease, infertility, obesity. If you fix the mothership, there might not be a trickle down effect. You know, it's nature and nurture. Where do you think nurture comes from? That's a great saying. Fix the mothership. Fix the mother. There's a t-shirt. Run with it, Chris. Yeah, yeah, it's a t-shirt. But I don't know. People, there's still a stigma as if we're making it up, you know, that these mental disorders, including being frazzled, is something we can perk up. That's my latest. Perk up, because I didn't think of that. Yeah. And then many of your books, you mentioned stigmatiz stigmatization, mental health, uh, mental health is... Uh, Ill, mental ill health is being stigmatized. What role do you think, you know, if you're going to the uh, psychiatrist, people say like that, or if I'm taking antidepressants, you're not, are you? What role can mindfulness play in kind of bridging that meant from mental ill health to yeah. mental health to flourishing, you think? Well, I'm, I'm a real fan of mental, um, of, of medication. You know, I bow at the feet of Lamont. And it's a disease, you know, it's not I, to me and people will argue it's either like being pregnant or not pregnant. If you have bipolar, it wasn't because you had a bad hair day. It's dangerous. Or, you know, schizophrenia. This is not your imagination. And either is depression. It's not because you woke up sad. It's a death in the you can teachers should spot that there's nothing in their eyes for a few weeks and then they're in trouble. So um, where does mindfulness come in? If you're in the depth of depression, don't do mindfulness, don't do therapy, because as I said, you haven't got a mind. But when you come out of it, you know, some of this is episodic or you're coming back to a base level and every disease, you get to a base level at a certain point. Then you have to go to the gym and that's where mindfulness comes in. So I believe in mindfulness and medication. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like double condoms. <laughs> I wouldn't, know I'm a, I, I wouldn't know I'm a Catholic. All right. Well, <laughs> I've never tried it, but I heard rumors. <laughs> but, you know, um, when you, if you, if you know any other way of, of strengthening those parts of the brain that make you more resilient and give you the ability to shift your focus where you want it and not get dragged away to distraction. I mean, that's my definition of happiness. You know, we miss half of our lives because somebody's flagging up shoes that we should buy. And, you know, there's these genius engineers now that can take our distraction and turn it into money. So we really need to, I mean, I have to say for mindfulness, I can pull focus pretty quickly. I wouldn't be doing it every day if I didn't see something, but I'm as, you know, I have a bad temper and anger is my drug of choice. But when I have a flare up, I can get it down much quicker. And I haven't had a depression in seven years. If I have one tomorrow, Chris, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> but I can feel it coming and then I do something. 
to so that I might have depression, but I'm not depressed about dep being depressed. But um, mindfulness does come in because the mind has to be trained. You wouldn't play piano because you dreamt about it. You wouldn't learn language because you tried it once. And so the brain is another muscle. It's not positive thought. And people say, well, is mindfulness when I'm running or when I'm gardening or, you know, those are really good running for endorphins and flow is really something, you know, that's such a pleasurable state. But unless you do, you know, it's like going to the gym and not lifting the weight and just lying there. That's pleasurable. But unless you use um, watching the thoughts take over, or let them, you know, let let this gabbling go. And then gently, 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 you haven't done anything wrong. That's the exercise. Come back to one of the senses. Then the mind takes you, you come back to the senses. That's how you build. That's how you buff up those parts of the brain. You can call it a muscle. It's, you know, more neural growth, but I don't want to confuse people. It's like Mark Williams, I think says, you need the thoughts to come back to the, come back to the sense, either smell, taste, sound, touch one of those and you have to have the two it, otherwise it's like going to a gym and there's no equipment so i mean that's where mindfulness comes in if you do tai chi if you do yoga without being distracted or competing with everybody to tie your feet in a bow over your head or pilates if you're focusing on the body or certain martial arts well tai chi is a great example um if you can go into the body and, and watch the focus and stay with it, that's, that's I, I think Elise, Elise, are we watching TV? <laughs> I think Elise has uh, turned her uh, microphone off there. Um, oh, that's a, is that Welsh? Are they going <laughs> to are they going to say something now? It's Tom Jones. <laughs> Right. So um, in your books uh, or in your writings, you, you have uh, mentioned quite often that the human mind is not equipped for the pressures of the 21st century. And um, can you expand on that a little? What, what do you think are the specific pressures that we've got this century that we didn't perhaps have in the last century? And what role can mindfulness play in in counteracting these pressures? Well, you know, the Spanish Inquisition was a little more stressful. And, you know, <laughs> and in the past, you know, people didn't die of stress. They died of bad teeth or childbirth or old age, about 12 and a half. You know, so um, there was more, there were more problems. Now we're more civilized than we ever have been before. More people are educated. We live longer. But but the, we aren't equipped to deal with so much choice that you know drives us nuts. I mean, but listen, that's the way it is. I'm not gonna bitch about technology. I wouldn't be talking to you if there wasn't technology, but everything becomes addictive. You know, we're, we're technologically geniuses, but emotionally we're still idiots. And so, you know, we haven't caught up. It's like we have to um, upgrade our minds like we upgrade our iPhones. Again, this is just the way it is. We're not gonna discuss why we're not gonna, you know, but the complexities now of, of so much attention pulling and so much um, you're never good enough and photos of people that have more money and more better teeth and better lives, you know, they're lying, but we have no way of catching them. Um, just provokes this, a sense of low self-esteem and self-hatred, which I don't think has ever been around before. I think 50 years back, they just got on with it. You know, they had, they were born and then they died and they plowed a field or, you know, they were lucky enough to run whatever they, rail, railroads. But I don't think there was this criticism and that criticism, that self, uh, that, that voice, um, that self-reflection is, um, is a new phenomenon, which I call frazzled and frazzled by, isn't my word, it's neurobiological. It's a neurobiological word that means stress about stress. And that's new. So we can't deal with some complexities of the 21st century. You know, our mind, our brain is still caveman and it doesn't realize the wallpaper's changed. So we can't, we can't keep up with it unless we train this, this mothership and then it can deal with, you know, what's going on in the world. It's each man for himself. If you don't want a six pack, don't go to the gym. 
and mindfulness isn't for everybody. And you know that yeah, yeah. if it really doesn't work, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. If it's too, if it's too much and you can feel it, it's not for you, but we're very disconnected from our instincts, you know, but it, some people hate learning to ski or learning piano. There is a moment where there's a breakthrough and it becomes pleasurable. So I wouldn't walk away after day one, but if you really don't like it, don't do it. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you've come up with some interesting ones there, the pressures, choice, technology, addiction, complexity of life, um, self-criticism, lack of self-compassion, that they are really big pressures and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and but thanks we're, not for taught, we're not taught self-compassion, you know, when, when, when there's so much what I don't have and, you know, advertising promising, if I just get that, I'll be happier. Well, of course we fall for it and then you get it and you're miserable again. There isn't a lot of room for self-compassion, but we're born with it. Um, you know, we're born with compassion. So something happens, something happens. I mean, again, mate, some people still have it, but some of us are just too busy. to. Th what, what do you think that, that something is that sucks out the self-compassion? Well, I think th this sense, it's each man for himself. You know how, yeah. I always think this is interesting that when Darwin said survival of the fittest, he didn't mean the survival of the toughest and the yeah. most aggressive. He meant survival of the guy who, um, or the woman who uh, cooperates the best. The one who's well yeah. liked is the one that passes his genes. But then the industrialists turned it to their favor to say, yeah, we have to be a killer and the poor don't deserve it. And we've been living under that illusion. Um, and so there isn't a lot of room for it's compassion has been too gooey. It's too um, flaky. And if you stop to give somebody compassion, chances are you're the loser. That's, that's what I grew up with. You know, my dad was a killer and uh, there was no room for compassion there. But I said to Mark Williams, being a depressive, I can't really talk about self-compassion because we stigmatize ourselves more than anybody else. And he said, the fact that you could sit there, watch your thoughts and not beat yourself up for them, just watch them objectively. He said, that's self-compassion. I thought, well, that's pretty good. And then it moves on. So when somebody's giving you their grief, you start to realize that they must have their own recordings that are giving them hell. So I don't have to take it so personally. You know, they're listening to something horrific inside them. I'm not saying I always forgive them, but if we can kind of have a little bit of understanding. You know, we work, I always, I didn't make this up. We work like neural Wi-Fi. So if I'm highly agitated, I'm passing it straight to you and you pass it to the next guy and the next guy, and that's how you create war. But if we can, again, it's bottom up. If the individual can cool it down, you know, bring it, bring that shattering mind down, they pass that state to their kids and their coworkers and their community and the world. And so does, neuro so does neurosis. You can pass either ball, but it does come again from the individual and then move it to the community because we, we only survive with community. But I, that's how frazzled works. We begin and end with mindfulness. That's how people are able to think clearly. Otherwise we just get on and say, my day was horrible, but you know, we bring it down and then everybody's in their right mind and can talk clearly about what's going on for themselves. You mentioned materialism and consumerism, and you are what you own. You, you uh, wrote a book with a, a Buddhist monk, Tupton. And do you think there's a difference in the East and West between these, uh, the, the different attitudes towards materialism and consumerism and, 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 and valuing uh, or different sets of values? Can we learn anything from the, from the East? But we're not from the East. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the book was written with a monk and a neuroscientist and actually they met, you know, they, yeah. the neuroscientist said what develops in the brain and the monk said how the mind works and what the training does. And, you know, the neuroscience totally agreed. He talked about the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. He actually used Tupton's bald head. <laughs> Tupton loved it. It was like getting a massage every night because we toured this show too. His eyes rolled back in happiness. So you know, up here is the chattering mind, but these parts here are able to, I used to say it's like tr like pulling back a horse when it's gone wild. Tupton said that's not what it's like at all. But again, he uses a part of the brain and I've seen it because he's got long COVID and I watched the panic, but then it comes down really quickly. 
you know, we're still human, but he's able to kind of break, you know, uh, it's, didn't Kevin Zinn, my favorite expression said, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf them. Yeah, yeah that's what he does. So whatever the, the, and they were a great couple, the monk and the neuroscientist, the book is called How to Be Human. It's one of my best. Uh, because they talk to each other, the monk and the neuroscientist at the end of every chapter. So they talk about education, relationships, um, evolution, money, the whole thing. And then there's a chapter, my favorite called Sex. And it starts off, you know, because I interviewed them. I say, Tukton, when was the last time you had sex? And it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's not a personal question. <laughs> yeah, well, we talked to him. And then he said about uh, 20 years ago. And then I have four blank pages, just nothing. And then at the end, it says, well, that about covers it. <laughs> People thought it was an accident. Why did I have four blank pages? Anyway, that was my favorite. But, you know, they talk about what happens at different ages and relationships and Oh, it's just, you know, to watch those, one knew the meat and the brain and the other was knew the mind. Watching them, you know, tango together was a pleasure. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, you had a career, your first career, interviewing the rich and the famous, and it was fantastic. We saw your, uh, your programs back in September, the, the, picking at the highlights of those. In all of the people that you interviewed, who would you say was the most naturally mindful. Who was oh, the well, Goldie. Goldie Hawn wasn't totally mindful when we met, but she put, uh, she put her money where her mouth is. She put all the money into getting those scientists to do research on mindfulness, including Dan Siegel mm -hmm. and including Richard Davidson. And she came up with a program called Mind Up, which is teaching kids mindfulness, and it's in 4,000 schools. So she was well on her way. Not then, she was as mindful as I was, which is zero, but <laughs> we went on the same path, totally obsessed with ourselves. And we went to India together, it was ridiculous. She went on a shopping spree and I wrote about it and she didn't like what I wrote. But um, 20 years later, she pulled, you know, she did something remarkable. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable, when mindfulness is, is, is like a gift that you're given and then you want to give it away and uh, the people that you come across in mindfulness circles, uh, that have been touched with mindfulness and to give it away. They're inspirational. And it's, it's, uh, it's great that Goldie is, is your choice. Now, if it's not a bit unmindful of a question, who was the most unmindful? Donald Trump. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, OJ Simpson and Bill Cosby were way off the chart. I mean, they didn't know what their actions were at all. So, you know, that's why they ended up in prison. They don't feel guilty at all. They know how to blank it out. They, they have no interception. What's that word that means you know how, you know, you watch the workings of your mind. So they act out and assume somebody else has done it. OJ thinks somebody else killed his wife. You know, you can't get less mindful. Yeah. And, uh, well, perhaps there's a, a case for a, a stronger presence of mindfulness in prisons to help the those people that are struggling, that do not have those skills to... Uh, uh, have, you, have you done any work in the prisons? No, yeah, but have you seen Dharma Brothers? It's people on death row, and then they go on a... a they do a whole, you know, training, Buddhist training, and you watch what happens in the end. It's unbelievable what happens. It's called Dharma Brothers. So I do it in a psych ward. I, I teach mindfulness in a... In a in the psych ward and also to refugees and um they never they what i always think they're going to be traumatized but they really their mind comes down and they can finally relax and sleep which is something they complain about could you could you say more about the refugees i mean it's a big crisis now in the uk and around the world and more people chris, are going to be moving um, chris yes can i just say something here's a bigger crisis I'm going to change uh, to my phone, okay? Right. So I'm going to do this because I'm a, I'm. It's just before this. This doesn't work anymore, okay? Do you see how calm I am? Now I'm going to go on now, and I'm going to switch from. Um, if there's a technical person out there, just let me know. So I'm going to go to this, okay? Which one is, um, there's a lot of numbers here. Is this Welsh? 
Which one is the zoo? It's H T T P S. Okay, I'm gonna try it. It says Zoom meeting. Yeah. And it says, uh oh, you seem to have lost your way. <laughs> what you are looking for. Check our upcoming events. Please help me, Chris. Please. Are we a, is there a technician in the house? Okay, look, I'm can you see um, this? I can't see it, but if you right, scroll look. down, Ruby, yeah. have, you, have you got yeah? Oh no. Which one's the zoom? Uh Pass. I put the code in for somebody else. I'm just going back through the chat. There Send we go. It Send it to in me. In the chat, it. yeah. I, uh, My, um, and I, as an email. Oh, somebody's just sent it on the, uh, Selena has just sent it on the chat room. No, but I need it in my phone here. Okay. Yeah, I'll send it to you as an email. Give me a minute. Have you ever done this before? <laughs> no. I haven't either. So are you going to, you're going to email it to me? It's, yes, uh, and Liz will be on that. Let's answer that straight away. Okay. If I suddenly go blank, it's not because I've gotten bored with you. <laughs> because I'm at five. I can't believe this has happened. Yeah, you're at five percent. I'm at five, so she yeah. better send it fast. Yeah. I'm trying to find you, Ruby. What's your? I got you. Know, hang on a minute. Email address. Did you? From something we exchanged earlier, but do you think I can find it? This panic. I'm breathing. Feet on the floor. <laughs> I, yeah. Mindfulness in action. Absolutely. Chris, you have my email. Mm. This is unbelievable. Well, this is mindfulness in action. <laughs> I'm breathing. Um, I'm feeling the wire. Ruby, how about if you if you send it in a private message, private chat to Liz or Chris, if you do that? Chris, I can Chris, private you chat me message. All the time. You, you, Chris, you talk to me all the time. I do. So you must have my, um, here goes, I'm sending it to you. Wait, there you go. Right, Ruby Wax, I shall forward that to Liz now. Okay. Okay. Is everybody still on? <laughs> okay, here it is. Do you have it? Yeah, right there. Just or sent it to you. Have, do you have it? I just sent uh, your okay. email address to uh, to Liz. Okay, Liz, send it back. Send me the con yeah. I mean, I have it on my computer, but I can't use it much longer. <laughs> which did you e which of my email addresses did you use, Chris? Uh, Elizabeth Williams, uh, Living Mindfully, I think. Okay, let me get to the right page. I've got it. Okay. There, we go. there we go. Got Ruby. Here we go. And there we go. There's a message here. We are breathing with you, Ruby, Chris, and Liz. Breathe with us. Much. Breathe with us. Breathe in. My mindfulness exercise. And when I leave you, focus your attention on your feet, on your bum, where you feel yourself sitting, and breathe into this. What, what does Mark say? This envelope of skin called you. So as I say good night, because I'm at four. And Liz is unable to send me an email. I can't send it. How weird is this? There we go. Well, maybe we were destined. Maybe yeah. we were. There we go. Chris, did you get my email? I got it. I did. I've just sent it. She just sent it. Okay, I'm at three. Is everybody breathing? Well, we wanted to do a practice, didn't we? And now you'll <laughs> notice <laughs> all my thoughts. With feet on the floor. Yeah, but my thoughts are going, this is a real screw up. I'm at three. I'm going uh, to Chris. I still haven't gotten your, your, um, and then I just take my focus back to my breath. What percentage are you, are you on, uh, Ruby? I'm on two. 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 Wow. Do you have a pen and paper that you can? I'm going to write down. You can't. You can't send me this. 
Liz, maybe I can, if you try me. I've, I've already sent it. No, I, oh, here we go. Okay. Hooray. You're in, Ruby. Wi-Fi or cellular. Okay, here we go. Well, something's happening. <laughs> You'll need to maybe turn your other one off now, Ruby. Okay. How's that? I can hear you. Can you see me? Not yet. Oh. Well, I have. Uh, I'm yeah, I can on. See you now. I can see you now. Okay. So, and it's just the right point to come over because uh, the talk was from seven o'clock, or the question and answer session was from seven o'clock till quarter to eight. It is now quarter to eight. My little alarm's gone off. So, uh, we, we, uh, if, if, if there's anybody out there, we want to widen the question and answer to uh, to everybody who's attending here tonight, and if they can put them into the chat room, and I think. Uh, We've got somebody in the chat room who's going to go through them and pick them Chris, out. While they're putting it in, what was your last question? So my, last we question was, uh, my last question was, could you tell us something surprising, weird, and embarrassing that's happened to yourself over the years? Oh, can I just say before I get to that, there's a question that says evolution only cares about your survival, not about us being happy. Uh, somebody sent that question. Yeah. So if yeah. you want to pick on that one, that's uh, that, that's that's great. Uh, yeah, I did say it couldn't give a crap about your happiness. Um, you know, what made us survive was the uh, animals have teeth and claws and venom. And we got um, we got our our hands and our brains so we could build tools so that we could, you know, communicate faster and that we could saying you know make spears and then eventually missiles we just kept upgrading to survive when we think something negative and this is interesting too I, they say i think rick hatton said rick hatton says um out of five thoughts four are negative that were velcro to negative thoughts and uh, yeah to Tef negative Tef thoughts and teflon to positive ones is because every time you um note you know when you notice something's gone wrong you're, you have to remember it so you don't do it again. You know, if there's a step that's, you know, makes you trip, you're gonna remember that that fourth step, something's faulty so that you, you know, watch it next time. If you just had happy thoughts, it doesn't register a lot in the memory because you're just happy. <laughs> so, you know, the way evolution works is we're always like animals. They're always look, on the lookout for danger. Well, so are we. But as we were saying earlier, there's more danger now and it's it's more mental. And so um, we're not going to be suddenly joyous with our heads thrown back, but we have to eliminate the constant distraction. You know, if something's about to kill you or mug you, yeah, you need to pay attention. But when you're sitting at home and suddenly the voices are saying you're not good enough and you're not working hard enough, that's when we have to pull the brakes. So really evolution was just trying to save us. It, it didn't have to do with getting a self-help book. <laughs> okay, we, so. Uh, we got another question there. There's, uh, oh. can you spot that in the chat room, Ruby? Ruby, uh, do you see, do you, Ruby, do you see your use of humor when discussing and teaching mindfulness as an avoidance technique or a, a, a as, a, as an avoidance technique or a benefit? Well, uh, because I do shows, if I started talking about mindfulness or my depression and I wasn't funny, I'd clear that auditorium. Um, I'm not a usual mindfulness teacher where everybody wants to learn the technique. I'm talking to people who've never heard of it. So if you make them laugh, um, their mouths are open and then you can shove anything you want into it. You have to, <laughs> you have to deserve it. So I don't start teaching mindfulness till about, 38 minutes in and then the audience just go along with it and this is a paying audience so some of my shows end in silence 
which is unusual for a comedy show. But I have to bring in humor, otherwise who'd listen to me? You know, Mark Williams is much more brilliant, but I'm funnier. <laughs> Right, there's, there's questions are plenty coming up there uh, oh. Ruby, in the chat room, and I'm sure if you can access it and pick, pick which yeah. ones. Uh... Well, no, no, you do it, because otherwise I'll lose you. Right. Ruby, I feel so inspired to read more about what you've been talking about today. I'm not sure what book to read first. What one would you re recommend? Well, if you want to learn about mindfulness, I did, and under with Mark's blessings, uh, a, a mindfulness guide for the frazzled where I do give my, I, I use the, the techniques that you have to use in order to develop those parts of the brain, but I use it more in practice, the exercises that are more practical. It's when you're, you know, when you're with your kids, when you're trying to go to sleep, when you're driving, you know, when you're, you know, what you can do in 24 hours, how to pull yourself into those exercises when you're busy, because you can still develop those bits of the brain, even if you do two minutes a day. But I, Mindfulness Guide for Survival is the last one. And then the new book is coming out at the end of this month called, and now for the good news. So maybe I buy that so I can get into the charts. <laughs> Ruby, how do you consider that mindfulness assists with the cognitive function stroke cognitive load? How do you I mean, consider well, that I mindfulness think, assists yeah, with I, the cognitive function and cognitive load? Well, if cognitive function means how your brain works, um, if you read my book, <laughs> I do go through the different parts of the brain that do that do get um, more, I don't know, buff, is that the word? Or, you know, tougher, like a, a muscle gets stronger. Um, so that's enhancing your cognitive load. You can't enhance more cognitive than exercising bits of your brain. And um, it does make you more intelligent, but it makes you be able, you know, you can na navigate the, the storms. I think the last one I wrote is, you know, loneliness and change and uncertainty, they're not gonna go away, but somebody said, we're all in, uh, we're all in different boats, but we're in the same storm. So this is a, these are techniques and I use cognitive CBT and mindfulness to be able to get an anchor when the winds get rough again, because they will get rough again. And they are now. Okay, next question here. Uh, does, does Ruby feel her mindfulness practice has helped reduce or prevent episodes of depression? Well, I, as I say, I know when it's coming. Whereas before I was taken by surprise, you know, people with depression will know. What we do is we get busier because we don't want people to know we're ill. And then it, we become more ill. So this time when I can hear it coming and it has a specific tone, if I, cause I'm sort of trained, I trained myself to tune in. There's a certain sound and there's, even your hair gets depressed when that starts coming. The, the inner landscape starts to change. And then what I do is um, rather than have more parties, I, I've in the past, I've checked into a silent retreat, which costs 29 pounds a night. P.S. You don't need an institution. And then um, it still hurts like hell because, you know, mindfulness. I mean, um, depression is one of the most painful things for me that you can experience is that the depression, it passes like a devil over um, a demon over Last time I had it five days rather than five months. So you have to kind of buckle down and say, okay, this is where I am. This is what's happening. Um, and hopefully you've done enough mindfulness that you can find that anchor, but it still hurts. I mean, nobody's saying pain goes away, but you have a different relationship to the depression. And it, like my anger, it, you can pull it, you can disperse it quicker. Okay. It disperses quicker, faster. And there's one here now. How do you cope with the reality of your eventual, eventual natural mortality? Does it cause anxiety? A big thing oh, that's, that's, the last, the that's the last chapter in my book. The last one, A Mindfulness Guide for Survival. Death is fascinating. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to start my next book with, with death. I mean, um, rather than it being morose, I think, again, the realization that nature works like that and you're not out of nature, you're part of it, means that um, that the life you have every second is more poignant. So to be aware of impermanence really makes every second, um, you know, grateful to be alive. 
I, I, I don't think I'm aware of being alive unless I think about death. Okay, and I think we've got, it's, uh, we're going to stop at five two because we want you to uh, do, a, do a meditation for us, but I think we've got, uh, do people need to learn interoception before they try mindfulness? I think well, mindfulness is, mindfulness is uh, taking a snapshot of what's going on in the mind. It isn't blanking. Um, that's why I took mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is if, if you don't notice what's in your mind and just go to your breath, you've missed a, you've missed a, <laughs> you've missed a pretty big chunk because it's, a, you know, the, and I talk about it in the book, insight is probably the most important thing a human being can have because otherwise you just hurl your luggage at everybody else, you know, your frustration or your loathing or whatever and assume it's coming from them. So it's good to know what are your habits of thinking what are your, you know, what are your themes? Do you always catastrophize? Do you always say, who can I blame? Do you, uh, you know, go numb? If you're aware of it, it means that the buck stops with you. But, you know, a lot of times when you're angry and you don't realize it, you assume other people are, and they're taking it on on you. Does that make sense? It does indeed. It does indeed. So we're up to uh, 1955 now, Ruby. We've got five minutes left. Um, would you like to take a meditation for us? And, uh... Okay. Uh, can I just say, after the event of, um, of the, uh, after the horror event of um, having to shut down the computer and now using my phone, I'm going to try and balance it. Otherwise, I'm doing mindfulness while I'm holding the phone. Can't, can't happen. Oh, can you see me? Uh, no. Okay, that's good. Well, I'm going to do mindfulness now where you don't see me. Okay. <laughs> like I'm doing this on purpose, right? Okay. Okay, fine. We can hear you. Okay. So as I said, you can have your eyes open or shut. You know, this isn't a spooky thing. Eyes open or shut, and um, if you're sitting in a chair, which I assume you are, as I say, I always, I know how to do, you know, I talk about mindfulness moving, mindfulness eating, but we're sitting, so let's just stick with it. So uh, sitting on the chair, and again, taking your focus as far away from your gambling brain as you can, which is the other end of your body, your feet. So really seeing if you can sense the footprints of both your feet. So you feel from the front toes to the heel, side to side. Just see if you can notice that or sense it rather than think about it. And then just letting go of the focus there and bring it, bring that focus to the sense where you're sitting on the chair. So you feel the back of your thighs bottom of your pelt, you know, the weight of you, the circumference and all the flesh between, just feel that, feel the chair. And now just let that focus go and bring it to another sense. So now just bring it to listening. So you're just hearing sound. Just let it come in, what's in the right, left, above, behind, below. And you're not trying to hear nothing. You just notice the pitch or the volume. And then at some point you're gonna notice the thoughts come in. They have to, this is part of the human palate, so. You'll notice they're starting to snare you. Either you're thinking about not liking this or what's later, or your mind is just taking you away. This is your opportunity to notice what your thoughts are. You're not trying to avoid them. And then again, without giving yourself a hard time, because this is the exercise. 
just really gently take your focus back to sound. Again, you're just listening. And then it's, it's subtle, but you might notice that the thoughts are there, which they're always there, but now you're just tuning in. And whatever they're telling you or whatever the score is, or if you blanked out, just again, the exercises, notice it bring it back to the sound. And now we'll just let go of the sound in the same way you notice sound, just take your focus to where you notice you're breathing. So you're just observing it rather than trying to take control. So it could be, just choose tip of the nose, mouth, chest, abdomen. And you're just, well, you're observing how air knows to go into you and, and leave again without you interfering. And then the thoughts have to come. Whatever they're telling you, it's fine. Because they're just thoughts. They're not reality. And so you notice, okay, I don't know where I've gone or I want to get up or whatever the impulse is. Again, bring your focus back without beating yourself up just to where you were breathing. And now maybe <clears throat> to finish, let's just all try to count five breaths, just five. And if you lose your way, it's not a contest. Just go back to one. And don't interfere. You just let the breath breathe you. So in out is one. We're going to five. Okay, you can stop. Are you still there? Still here. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Ruby. It's been fantastic you, to, uh, to have you here in Wales and around the world. Uh, uh, via Zoom. We've learned so much from you. We've got things to take away and think about and how we can progress mindfulness in Wales. And can I ask all those that are, that, that, that are attending here tonight, if you can sign up uh, to Mindfulness Wales so we can communicate with you. And if you can spare any small donations to help Mindfulness Wales, you've only been going nine months. We put on a whole series of these. Uh, and because we have big stars, we have to pay extra Zoom. <laughs> uh, so if you can make a small donation just before Christmas, that would be really well uh, appreciated. So thank you everybody for coming, but most of all, thank you, Ruby. For thank you. Fantastic Tell show. them I did everything on purpose, okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 Tell yeah. them that. <laughs> right. And, and people can make a donation via the website. And I'm just putting the uh, URL in the chat. Okay. And you'll put Frazzle Cafe in there. Yes, a yeah. link to Frazzle okay. Cafe. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the interview, Chris. Right. And thank you very much, Ruby. Thanks. Thanks for doing Bye -bye. this. Bye -bye. Oh, and thank you, Chris, for it's hosting left. that. And thanks right. to everybody for coming. And we won't leave it there, will we? Do you know what? this? It, it seems to me that this is a model for how we want to take mindfulness forward in Wales. We take it really seriously, like Ruby. Nobody takes it more seriously than her. But we carry it lightly yeah. so that we can have fun, we can connect, we can communicate we can have that that community together uh, and that just seems to me to be such a model uh, for what we take forward uh, so we've we will be we will write out to all of you uh, using the mailing list that we've got for tonight uh, so that everyone can you know have a chance to see if we can take something forward and Chris actually 
can, uh, can help us with, with taking forward the Frazzle Cafe idea and, and any others that we've got we've got there then. Uh, but we've got lots of other ideas for a programme for next year. So please join our mailing list so that you make sure you keep, keep in touch because what we're hoping is that it won't just be our events, although the events have been tremendous and they've really established us as a community. But we're hoping to extend our activities to, to some other things as well there. Uh, and so any, any donations towards us being able to extend the reach of what we do, particularly to make sure we can extend the reach to, to people who can't, you know, ha haven't actually got the privilege of being able to pay for their own training and things like that. We've got all sorts of, of ideas that we may want to, to, to make mindfulness accessible and available uh, and donations will help us to, to look at how we might be able to do that. Um, and we'll have a programme for next year. We've got a couple of things. We'll, we'll have an education event. A couple of you have mentioned education. We'll have an education event in uh, early next year. Uh, we've got compassion. Uh, we've got some compassion expertise in Wales in the Nairn Bethan Health Board. We've got a compassion event on the 1st of March and the rest of our programme is gradually being worked out there. So please join our mailing list to make sure that you're kept in touch. And there's an email address, there's an email contact thing on the website. If you go to our website uh, and we'd welcome your ideas. This is, this is not just us as the, the nine of us are on the board. Mindfulness Wales is a network of all of us uh, working together. And I think we can all take this forward and we can do such a lot together. So thanks to everyone. Um, please say, go to our website. Everything is there. Welcome to donations. Thank you all for the support and turning up tonight. What a wonderful evening it's been. Uh, and have a lovely Christmas and New Year. Stay as safe as possible. Uh, and we'll be in touch with news of the next event uh, after Christmas. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Go safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, you. bye everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.